Hi, everyone. This is Cincinnati Software Craftsmanship. I am, it's great to have you with us. I am going to go ahead and drop a wave in the chat. Feel free to wave back. It's just a kind of a weird virtual way of saying hi. So a lot of you have been following us on social media and we really appreciate that. Uh, if you haven't followed us yet, you should probably do that right now to make sure you catch up with catch all our latest announcements. Of course, Twitch and YouTube are our primary content hubs, so you want to make sure to follow us there as well. Also want to thank Courier Technology for sponsoring the meetup as usual. We also want to, I also want to personally want to say thank you to the Cincinnati Software Craftsmanship organizers. They provide a ton of help behind the scenes and could not do this without them. I want to give you a reminder that to stick around after the talk, we'll be giving away a license for any one JetBrains product. Like last month, we're going to go ahead and start the giveaway registration right now. And this will give you plenty of time to sign into Twitch and register for the giveaway. We know that you don't even need any extra incentive to follow us on Twitch, but we're gonna give you a little bonus. If you follow us, your chances of winning are gonna be double that of winning if you don't. So, as I said, just you, to enter, you wanna type CSC in the chat as Mubot has told you. Couple of quick announcements. The call for speakers for the first annual Get With It conference is now open. WitCon 2021 is a virtual conference to celebrate women in technology in Cincinnati, planned and organized by a team of Cincinnati volunteers. They are looking for 15 minute lightning talks on a variety of tech topics. Anyone can submit from first timers to experienced conference speakers. We'll drop a link with more information about the conference and how to apply in the chat. As restrictions are starting to lift, in-person gatherings are starting to come back. And if you are itching to see the community in person again, you can join the folks at Drink Up tomorrow night and have a beer with some tech friends. We're going to drop that link in the chat as well. Let's give a big Cincinnati Software craftsmanship welcome to Jay Harris. Can we get that little applause for Jay in the chat there? Hello, everyone. Hi, what, hi, Jay. Welcome. So um, I won't uh, take any more of your time. Let's with then without any more ado, let's learn about design. How's that sound? Thank you, Jay. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for for joining. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Um, so we're going to be talking about design. Uh, specifically designed for a non-designer. I'm I'm not a designer. I'm assuming, hoping, probably most of you are in the same boat. Uh, we understand the need for design, but we also know that we are not designers. Design takes a particular talent that perhaps we don't seem to have, um, but we end up using that as almost a crutch, as an excuse to, to make our designs our designs ugly, to make them hideous, to just uh, make them battleship gray, like an old Windows 3.1 uh, interface, or just slap on some bootstrap and call it good. And oftentimes, well, we know there's more to it than that, uh, but it's our crutch, right? It's our excuse. So that's the effort that we put in. We tell ourselves, hey, I didn't go to design school. I don't have that design talent. It's not for me, so this is this is what you get. But at the same time, we're software developers. We understand the rule, the law of software development. We come up with so, 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 so many acronyms about software development that can explain how we're supposed to not repeat ourselves or that our designs are supposed to be solid or so many other things. Um, but uh, the real struggle is with design is that, or maybe the benefit uh, is that design is the same way. Design is not any different. Uh, certainly uh, software programming 
development takes a level of talent, but on top of that talent is a base, basic set of just fundamentals that anybody can follow, and same with design. Uh, there's certainly a talent aspect to good design, but underneath it all is a set of, uh, of rules, of a set of laws that we can follow too. We're good at following laws. We're good at following rules of software development. Maybe if we just at least knew what they were, we could follow some of those basic practices, those, those fundamentals, and make designs that are not quite so hideous, make our, our, our users, our audience, hate us a little bit less with these, well, not quite as horrible things that we're making. I'm Jay Harris. Uh, I come to you today from uh, my home in uh, beautiful, sunny Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, in the Zoom chat earlier, I, uh, I said that it was 106 degrees for the forecast today, but apparently that was inaccurate. I checked the thermometer and it's 108 degrees outside. I like it. I love the sun. I, I, I like the heat. It's more than just the sun. It's like walking on the face of the sun. And I enjoy that. So it works for me. Um, but one thing I am not is I am not a uh, designer. Uh, I know that I did not go to design school. Uh, I've been developing front ends. I've been developing interfaces for well over 20 years. Uh, but I'm still a, a developer. Uh, I've worked with some uh, phenomenal developers. I, I cut my teeth uh, in this industry working for uh, a, a branding and marketing company, um, working with uh, some of the great um, minds of design, of marketing, of, of UIs, of how everything all fits together. And I suppose I've learned a little bit from osmosis, uh, but I'm I'm still just a developer. So I guess come at with that with that grain of salt. But to me, that's. That's the idea. This is designed for non-designers from a non-designer. Maybe it's I speak the language of developer. Who knows? Um, now, as far as getting all of this started, we need to, before we can really get into the fundamentals of design, we need to understand the why of good design. Why are we here? Why do we need designers? What's the point of having a designer on the team? What do they do? And inevitably, if this was an in-person talk, if I could hear all of your voices, someone would pipe up that their job is to make it pretty. We've all thought it. Most of us have probably said it. It's their job to make it pretty. We make it work and they make it pretty. But that's wrong. As developers, we get this entirely wrong. We get this absolutely fundamentally at its core wrong. The fundamental uh, purpose of design, uh, that why is not about pretty, it's about usability. Uh, it's about making that site or that application uh, appealing, uh, making it cohesive, making it familiar, making it intuitive. Um, and that cohesiveness, that familiarity is just as important as the underlying functionality and oftentimes even more so. Think about, think about downloading an app on your phone from whatever app store for whatever phone you use. Think about downloading that app and playing that app. You're gonna judge that app instantly. Now, if that, ja that, if that app is, is a little bit buggy, you're going to judge it a little bit slower than if it's ugly, if it's hideous, if it's hard to use, if it doesn't make any intuitive sense whatsoever, if the buttons are the wrong spot, if you hate the gradients on the text boxes, you're going to judge the look of that application far faster than you ju judge the functionality uh, of that application. That's really what the why is behind design. A good example uh, is bars on a door. Uh, and I mean the bars that make us, makes the door open and close, the, the, the element of the door that we interact with. If you walk up to a door, uh, if you walk up to a door at the building and there's a horizontal bar at the door, what are you gonna do? You're gonna push the door. If you walk up to a door and there's a vertical bar on the door, what are you gonna do? You're gonna grab a hold of that bar and pull it. Horizontal bars are for pushing and vertical bars are for pulling and we just know that. And of course, every once in a while, we encounter that one door where somebody, some designer thought that their door was special, that nope, this one's unique. I don't need to follow the rules. My door is special. My door is, a, is an eloquent, unique snowflake. So we're gonna put horizontal bars on both sides of the door. 
And now all of its users have a 50-50 chance. 50% of the time, you're going to walk up to that door and you're going to encounter the horizontal bar and you're going to push and the door is going to open. And the other 50% of the time, you're going to walk up to the door, you're going to see the horizontal push, you're going to push on it, and you're going to just face plant right into the glass of that fancy snowflake door. It's not going to be fun. Cohesiveness, familiarity of design. They didn't follow the fundamentals. And these are just fundamentals of good design, even industrial design. We didn't learn how to use a door. Our parents were like, now, Jay, when you encounter a door and it's got a horizontal bar, make sure that you push. But if you ever encounter a door and it's got a vertical bar, make sure that you grab a hold of that bar and pull on that door with all of your little three-year-old strength. That's not how it worked. Our parents didn't teach us how to use the door. Really, the door learned to use us because structurally, that's how we're built. Muscularly, skeletally, that's how we are built. If you think about, if you think about a big heavy box that's on the floor and you just want to push that box, slide it across the floor with all of its might, your hands are going to be, well, like you were pushing a horizontal bar. You're gonna push with your hands together. If you want to grab a hold of that box and slide it across the door or the floor towards you, you're gonna grab a hold of the sides, your hands are gonna be vertical and you are going to pull. Muscularly, skeletally, that's how we are built. And the door learned to use us. We are optimized to pull with our hands vertical. We are optimized to push with our hands horizontal and the door learned to use us. Fundamentals of good design. Unfortunately, not all designers really want to follow that. They didn't follow the fundamentals. So that's what we're here to discuss. Some of those basic fundamentals, six specifically, six basic elements of good design. First up is unity. It all starts. It all starts with unity. Unity is, it builds a sense of familiarity, of uh, a sense of branding, a sense of cohesion with your uh, design with your application, with your website. And there's two elements to that cohesion. First is a cohesion through structure. In an application, you almost commonly encounter that as some sort of a grid system. We've all used grid systems on our websites, whether it's you know, uh, uh, bootstrap or going all the way to you know the, the 360 GS system from 15 years ago. We've all used some sort of a uh, grid system on our applications. And what that provides is a consistent layout. That's the purpose of it. That's the point of the unity is a consistent layout. So that from screen to screen or from page to page within your application, headers always in the same spot. The nav is always in the same spot. The footer is always in the same spot. The body is always in the same spot. Think of how weird it would be with your application if you know the header was at the top on one page, but on the side, on uh, a different page, or the nav, that the nav was a banner across the top of the page on one page, but it was a sidebar running down the side of the screen on a different page. It would remind us of, you know, 1995 called and they want their GeoCities site back because that's how they were back then. This grid system gives us our cohesion through structure, that consistent layout. But it doesn't really matter what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what your grid system is. It can be a three column system, and that's okay. It can be a four column system, and that's okay. It can be a five column system, and that's okay. It can be a column system based on the Fibonacci sequence, and that's okay, as long as it's co cohesive and consistent throughout your application. The other aspect of our cohesion is through style. So the unity gives us cohesion through structure, such as with a grid system. It also gives us cohesion through style. Most commonly, we think about that cohesion through style as the colors that we choose, what sort of color palette we work with. And we'll dig into color quite a bit a little bit later. Another core element of that cohesion through style is uh, the typeface we use, that we, the font choices and font sizes uh, that we choose. We'll also dig into fonts and, and um, typefaces uh, quite a bit, a little bit later. One recurring theme that you'll hear from me throughout all of this is that there's always a story. There is always a story. There is always, 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 always a story in the designs that you build, the applications and websites you produce. And it's up to you to tell that story. But even if you don't, there's still a story. You're just not in control of it. 
You should be. You need to be. These three pie charts, they have unity. There's a consistent size. Uh, there's a consistent non-focused color. And these style choices provide cohesion through style. Their position, uh, the thirds on the layout, uh, pro provides a cohesion through structure. There's certainly plenty of unity here. There's always some level of unity. There's always a story. But because, because of the inconsistency of the highlighted color, the orange, the purple, the green, you, the audience, will automatically assume that there's no correlation between those three graphs. They are disparate because there's no unity. There's always a story, and that's the story that this current unity choice is telling. There's always unity. There's always a story. Even when there's not unity, there's always unity, and there's always a story. But what if these were the same? What if this was .NET developers at different conferences? The one on the left, the orange pie chart might be the .NET developers that are at a .NET conference. And the one in the center, the small purple pie piece, might be the .NET developers that are at a Ruby conference. And the larger .NET developers in the green spot space could be, I don't know, front-end developers or JavaScript conference, because you can't build a .NET application anymore without getting JavaScript involved. So we have a bigger pie piece at the JavaScript conference as well. But with these being different colors, there's no cohesion, there's no consistency, there's no correlation between these two graphs. But we can control that. I just changed the colors by adding some cohesiveness through style. Now, because they're all similar uh, colors, they're identical colors, even though they're on different data sets, we will just assume that it's similar data, uh, a, a repeated data group on three different data sets all because of that correlation, all because of that cohesiveness, all because of that unity. There's always a story. Second, first is unity, second is contrast. Contrast is in direct and absolute cooperation and direct and absolute opposition to unity. Contrast cannot exist without the unity. What contrast allows us to do is to quickly identify whatever the primary idea is. It allows us instant recognition of the important visual elements on the screen. Contrast, because of unity. There are five, five types of contrast. We have shade, we have color, we have position, shape, and contrast through size. There are many different methods and opportunities that we have to apply this, but shape, color, position, uh, shade, color, position, shape, and size are our five different uh, options for contrast. Through that contrast, we can very quickly identify, well, which one of these is not like the other ones. We can identify the contrast. We can identify the visual elements. We can apply that to text. On the left, there's no contrast. If this were in English, or if you can read Latin, you would start at the top left and work your way down through all three paragraphs because there's no contrast. Similarly, uh, on the right, well, you're not going to start at the top. You're going to start at the bold red contrast on uh, that second paragraph. You're going to read that first. You're not gonna, you might read all three paragraphs, but you're going to read that second one first. You might go back from the start and sort of that first paragraph for context. But the contrast draws your eye to uh, that second paragraph. So me as the designer, I can control that story. I get to decide where your eyes go first. And there's always contrast, because there's always a story, even if it's unintentional. Here, two graphs, a pie chart and a bar chart. What draws your focus? Of each graph, what draws your focus? Of course, it's size, because those are our five elements of contrast. So given no other contrast, size is the one that sticks out. And your eye is automatically drawn to the largest pie piece, the largest bar. How about now? I can control that story through contrast. I can control where your eyes go through contrast. You're no longer looking at, you no longer care 
about the largest piece of the pie simply because I've changed the contrast. Now your eye is drawn to color instead of size because now it's the one that sticks out because the rest have unity through the similar non-focused shade, the similar blue. The size no longer matters. The orange sticks out the most. So our first fundamental is unity. Our second one is contrast. Third is alignment. Alignment gives us association based on the location of the elements. It's all part of building out that story. Alignment is association based on the location of the elements. We know alignment most commonly with text. In our language, in English, we read English right to left. So most commonly, we're used to left-aligned text. This is great for large blocks of text. Well, great for us in English, great for most languages, great for all right to left languages. We also have right alignment. But English is not a right to, is not a right to left uh, language. It's a left to right language. So this alignment is not as intuitive for English readers. So we want to avoid it for large blocks of text. It works great for small amounts of text, but not for large. Use whichever it, alignment is most appropriate for your language. This would work great if you're writing in Arabic or in Hebrew, not so much in English. Of course, we also have center alignment. But center alignment is usually, it's dull. It's immature. It does not capitalize on any of the natural alignments with other elements of the screen. Recognizing just like there's always a story, there are always other elements to align to. This, even though there's nothing else on the screen uh, but the text, there's still natural alignments. The screen itself, the page, the window, the monitor's edge, there's always natural alignments to associate with. And center alignment doesn't really capitalize on any of them. You'll most commonly see this in greeting cards. Really, you'll most commonly see this in wedding invitations. However, they are very, very small uh, pieces of text. And usually, you already know what it says. And in opposition to that, of course, we have justified, where we align at both sides of the page, uh, both sides of the column, both sides of the text, not just one. This is fantastic for readability. This is fantastic for cohesion. This is the fastest that we can uh, read this. We can read text fastest in, justif in uh, justified uh, blocks of text. Why? Well, imagine for a minute one of those old typewriters, the really old uh, uh, Will Forrester punch the keys because you're Sean Connery kind of typewriter. Uh, and as you're typing along on that typewriter, as you get towards the end of the line and you're about to run out of room, the typewriter dings. Let's you know you only have a couple characters left, right? So with these alignments, um, your mind is sort of doing that. You're reading along, you're getting towards the end, towards the end of the text, and your mind goes ding, and then just like that typewriter, you grab a hold of that bar and you slam the entire block block of, of paper over to that left margin. Your eye knows automatically where to go. Let's call it, I don't know, a hundred pixels from the left of the screen. Your eye doesn't have to spend any time on its way back to the left edge going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there? Oh, there's the beginning of the line. That's where we need to start. It just knows, go back to 100 pixels from the left of the screen. With right alignment, we also get that same opportunity, or with justified alignment, sorry. With justified alignment, we get that same opportunity in the other direction. There's no line yet? How about now? How about now? How about now? Oh, here's some white space on the end. We must be done. Let's go back to 100 pixels on the left. With justified text, our eye just knows that we also have to keep going until we get to 100 pixels from the right. And also, it knows that if we encounter white space before we get to 100 pixels from the right, we're done with our paragraph. It's the last line of the paragraph. We're going to move on to a new topic now, new subject, a new paragraph. So this is our fastest because we eliminate those context switches. Imagine for a moment if you were in multi-line text and it was all just left aligned, not justified. 
maybe that gutter, the piece of white space in between that separates those two columns wasn't as consistent or it wasn't as big as it, used, as it could be. And it's all just left a line, not justified. So you're gonna be reading along and you're not gonna know if the line ended or not. And then you start reading some words that don't make sense at all. Because now you're also reading that top line on the second column instead of the first one. Oh, wait. Context switch, interruptions, distractions to your brain, right? So now with justified text, your brain just knows till, well, it's got to get to whatever pixels it is in the center. And then we're done with this column, go back to 100 pixels from the left. It's fast. And that's why newspapers use it as well. If you're going to use a, a, a multi column layout, like a newspaper, it's imperative that you use justified alignment on your text. Because again, it's association based on um, the location of the elements. With that alignment, uh, with that uh, justified alignment in this case, uh, we know that that alignment on that center column, that center gutter of white space uh, delineates the two columns. And it means that, hey, this block of text is associated with the left column and this block of text is associated with the right column. Now, whatever alignments that we use, uh, as I said before, there's also alignment with other things on the screen. Uh, even if it's just the margin off of the edge of the paper, off the page, off of the window, off of the screen. Alignment with those edges are just as important. Think about the last time you had to photocopy a sheet of paper and your page wasn't quite properly aligned with the glass on your Xerox machine. It was a little bit askew. And then you looked at that printed paper, printed piece of paper, that copy, and you could certainly tell that all of the paper was askew on every single copy that you printed. It was annoying, absolutely annoying. Of course it's annoying. It's a distraction to your mind. It's a context switch to your mind. And everything about this design is eliminating those distractions. Because if our mind is constantly distracted, we're uncomfortable. That's when we go delete the app. Those alignments can also be on other uh, elements on the screen. And even through that alignment, distance things are still aligned. We get that association, we get that familiarity, even on distant, uh, distantly separated things through that set of alignment. It doesn't matter how far away they are. So an example text, an example layout, this one's, pretty clean. This one's pretty clean because of the alignment. The red header aligns well on its left edge with the block of text. The top of the block of text and the bottom of the block of text also align well with the top and bottom of the uh, uh, associated uh, bar graph. Now, I said associated bar graph. Because of those alignments, we're building an association based on the location of the elements. That alignment builds the association between the text and the bar graph. We might be able to clean up that white space a little bit more, get rid of that trapped white space, as they call it, between the block of text and um, the bar graph. There's still a little bit left. If you sort of look, there's almost a, a backwards L between the bar graph and the text right now. We could clean that up and even write a line, right align that bottom text, but now we have a block of right aligned text, which is distracting. It's not as intuitive to read. So if this was to be the design selected for uh, this layout, leave this one to the folks that actually went to law school, leave, or law school, design school. Uh, leave this to uh, to the professional designers, which is not us. We're, we're just sticking to the fundamentals. Um, so go with uh, left or justified text on this one. So we have unity, we have contrast, we have alignment. Fourth is uh, proximity where alignment was creating an association based on the location of the elements of the screen. Um, proximity gives us why. Proximity gives us meaning based on the location of the elements that are displayed on the screen. Through proximity, uh, we have uh, automatic interpretation of the data. The graph on the left was perfect. Plenty clean, straight, linear plot. The one on the right, well, something went wrong. 
we're starting to get some sort of meaning based on the proximity of the elements. We automatically assume, because there's always, always, always a story, we automatically assume that something went wrong with that one dot, that one plot point. It gives us, through proximity, uh, an interpretation of relationships from the elements on the screen. On the left, perhaps this is a happy heterosexual couple with two kids. And on the right, not so much. That proximity, it gives us interpretation of the flow of data. Just because of changes in proximity of this tabular data, we can influence if the importance is on columns or if the importance is on rows. Proximity de defines, um, drives all of the flow of the, inter of the data that we have. Uh, is it predictable? Uh, is it inconsistent? Is it random? How is the grouping work? Is it all of a consolidated group? Is it separated groups? Are the elements entirely isolated from each other? We see this everywhere. Uh, even things like form fields on our website forms or applications. Those form labels absolutely should be grouped together uh, with the fields. We've seen applications, we've seen forms where uh, that form field is absolutely equally spaced between the field above it and the field below it. And you really don't know which one that label goes with. Does the label go with the form field above it? Does it go with the one below it? We don't know because Instead, that proximity has, chose, uh, has chosen an isolated layout rather than a grouped uh, layout. But all of these elements absolutely help drive that story. Fifth, hierarchy. Hierarchy is the relationship between the elements of the screen. So we have the associations based on the location. We have the meaning based on the location. Here we get the relationships between the elements. Some examples. On the left, the core takes priority. It's got the contrast. It's the larger element. Maybe this is the Secret Service protecting the president. All of the satellites, all of the outliers, all of the Secret Service agents are there to protect the middle, protect the president. In the center, equal priority. The contrast is the same. There is no contrast, there's only unity. And that helps build that hierarchy because all of these elements are completely related to each other. Maybe this is a sports team. Uh, the five players and the center is the ball uh, and or the puck. Uh, certainly, we want to protect the ball. We don't want it to go into our own goal, our own net. We want to go into the other team's goal, the other team's net. We want to score points. But but the players are just as important because if we eliminate one of the players, it's going to be challenging to play the game. It's hard to play a game of soccer. It's hard to uh, score in a game of hockey if you're playing with one fewer player than the other team does. Everything has equal priority. On the left... The children, those satellites, they have the priority over the center. Maybe this is truly just a parent with children. Most parents I know would absolutely, they'd even lay down their lives to protect their children. The children are the most important thing, even above self. So these hierarchies define and drive the relationship of the elements on the screen. We see that in text. Making sure that that title is the most important thing on the screen. Sometimes it's not. Really, almost always, it is. And then the primary ideas and the secondary ideas after that. Think about the newspaper. The New York Times. If you look at the New York Times, it says in the banner across the top, the New York Times is absolutely the biggest text on the entire front page of the paper. And then below that, the headers, the top of the article, and then below that, in even fault, fault, smaller font still, based on that hierarchy, the content of the article. It always follows this order and allows us to very quickly identify the hierarchy and the relationships of the text. Think about how easy, or really not easy, it would be to read the newspaper if all of the text was the exact same font size. 
in the exact same weight, the boldness. We wouldn't know where the article started in the beginning. We wouldn't know what the titles of the articles were versus the content. The banner, the New York Times always comes first. It's always the most important element. If it's not, something really went wrong in the world. If that primary idea is in bigger text than the page title itself, it's normally because, I don't know, war broke out or ended somewhere in the world. And the sixth element is white space. So we have uh, unity and contrast. We have um, alignment and proximity. We have hierarchy, and now we have white space. White space is the visual breathing room of all of the elements on the screen. And white space is what above all else drives the emotion of the elements on the screen. Because if there's a lot of stuff on the screen, it's very tight, it's very uncomfortable. We've encountered those applications where, I don't know, we go into the setting screen and there are just so many things, so many text boxes, so many bells and whistles and switches and gadgets and sliders and there's too much on the screen. There's so many controls and they're all jammed in one screen and our users are like, too much. Too much, I can't handle this, it's too much. So we give them some visual breathing room. We give them all a little bit white space, a little bit of white space. Now, this dot's not congested anymore. It's not tight. It's focused, it's important from its isolation. Maybe, is it? Maybe it's lonely. Maybe it's insignificant. One way or another, the white space drives the emotion. That's what its job is, is to drive the emotion of your design. Sometimes you want tight. Sometimes you want uh, that constricted, that constrained, that crowded feeling. Maybe that's sort of the emotion you want. I don't know, maybe you're, maybe you're building an application. Maybe you're making a poster for some new horror movie that just came out and that's the emotion that you want. You want tension and fear. There's always opportunities for emotion on your screen and it's important that you are aware of what that emotion is what's the emotion that you're choosing what's the emotion that you're choosing because that's the emotion of the story that you are telling so we've gone over those six fundamentals uh, unity contrast alignment proximity hierarchy and white space uh, one of the things that i wanted to go back to uh, first is color said that we would talk about color. So let's really dig into color. There's a lot of design surrounding color. Uh, color is a very significant element of a good design. So this is probably the color wheel that we as developers are most used to. Um, this is the color wheel for screen colors, additive colors, versus the color wheel used for print which is subtractive colors. What I mean by that with additive versus subtractive colors is ours, developers, monitors, screens, being additive colors based on uh, red and green and blue. If you mix all of them together, you get white. Our monitors have elements that can display green and red and blue, and we mix them all on our hex color code. We set them all the way up to FF if all, for all three sets uh, if we want to display white. The only way to get back to black is to take everything out, turn everything all the way off, versus subtractive colors used in print. Uh, yellow, cyan, and magenta are the three co uh, core colors. And with subtractive colors, if you mix everything together, you get black. Think of like in the paint store, you go down to Lowe's or the Home Depot and every single can of paint on the shelf is white. It's absolutely white. And if you take it over to the paint desk and you add even one drop of pigment, one drop, it's not white anymore. And there is no way to get it back. It's impossible to take that paint can and get it back to absolute pure white. It can't be done. Because the only way to do it is to take the pigment back out again, and that's not something that you can do. However, even though we have these two color wheels, our RGB additive colors and our CMYK, K is black, uh, subtractive colors, 
this isn't the color wheel used in design. Instead, we get this. We were taught when we were five that the three primary colors weren't red and blue and green. We were taught that they were red and blue and yellow. This weird blend of additive and subtractive colors built like 300 years ago from this old white dude with a really long beard that really didn't understand the science of color. He just understood the art of color. So this is the color wheel we use in design. Uh, it's based on red and blue and yellow, not red and blue and green or cyan and yellow and magenta. From this color wheel is where all of our color palettes come from. Let's dig into a few of those. First up is monochrome. Now, this graphic for monochrome is probably, no, nah, not probably, it absolutely is off. Instead of it being a pie slice to choose from, think of it as a, as a line, a direct line coming out of the center of this color wheel to the outside. And your color choices are somewhere along that line. You can pick blue, and I mean, you know, in, RGB world, maybe we're talking uh, 0000 FF blue, absolutely blue. Uh, the choices that we can choose are as secondary colors and tertiary colors and accent colors from this primary is light blue or light, light blue or light, light, light blue or dark blue or grayish blue, but that's it, not green, just different tints and shades and tones of blue. Tints are when we take a color and we add white. Shades are when we take a color and add black. And tones are when we take a color and we add gray. Now, these colors, they look very mellow. They look great. They are very clean. Uh, but they also have a very low contrast. It's tough to really build a lot of contrast between blue, light blue, and light, light blue. Really hard to do. This one is challenging, particularly for the inexperienced when it comes to building a good monochrome color palette and a design based on that monochrome color palette. So don't use this. Next, analogous. Analogous color schemes, uh, they're using the colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. They match well. Um, and they create a, a very serene, they create uh, comfortable designs. So if your primary color choice was blue, your secondary and your tertiary might be purple uh, and turquoise. Uh, analogous color schemes, uh, they're often found in nature. They're very harmonious. They're very pleasing to the eye, and we call that camouflage. We call that camouflage. The colors are very close to each other. If you think about it, squirrels are brown because trees are brown. The pink squirrels got eaten. They darwined out many, many centuries ago. It's all camouflage. With that, because camouflage is about reducing the contrast on purpose, analogous color wheels are very low in, in color contrast, and this makes it hard for the inexperienced to use. If you're using something like this, make sure you always choose which, which color you want to dominate. So in this case, blue, that's our dominant color, that's our primary color, and which one you want second to support. Um, that third color is going to be used as an accent. Not very often, it's just uh, used as an accent color, perhaps even along with black and white and gray. But you can always use black and white and gray, those aren't colors. Um, but choose which one is going to be your primary. It's gonna be the center in this one, the blue. Choose which one is secondary and choose which one is your tertiary and stick to that. So if secondary is purple, everywhere, secondary is, in your, is purple uh, and the turquoise will be your uh, tertiary. Don't mix it up from page to page, maintain your unity, maintain that consistency throughout the application. But here within our analogous color wheel, very low contrast. So like with before with monochrome, don't use it. Third, complementary. Complementary, I don't know, this name is kind of dumb. It's really opposites. They don't really complement each other. These colors hate each other. These colors are colors that are in direct opposition, directly across from each other on the color wheel. So red and green, uh, blue and orange. These ones are absolutely vibrant. 
because they have incredibly high contrast, absolutely vibrant when it comes to these choices uh, in your color wheel. But it can be very difficult because of that conflict. It can be jarring. Certainly not appropriate for text. You ever try and put red text on top of a green background? It doesn't work very well. It hurts your eyes. So um, these complementary colors, high contrast. Vibrant look, especially when full are uh, used in, in in full saturation. So green, you know, RGB zero zero FF zero zero. Um, it's tough to manage these. All oftentimes, there's even just a, a thin pen line of a tertiary color. And since complementary doesn't really have a tertiary color, that tertiary color would be uh, a black or uh, a white. So oftentimes, this orange and this yellow. Uh, for me, I'm from upstate New York, so these are the colors of the Syracuse orange. When you see that uh, Syracuse S, uh, whether it's orange on a blue background or blue on an orange background, there's often a little pen line right around that S just to separate those two apart, give them a little bit of space. It's tricky to use these color palettes. Sure, they have contrast, but there's so much contrast. It's turned up to 11. Don't use it. Split complementary. It's a variant on the complementary color scheme. Um, so the base color here in this example is blue, but that opposite color, which would have been orange, we take the colors that are on either side of the orange and that makes our uh, accent colors. That makes our secondary and our tertiary colors. So instead of blue and orange, we have blue and reddish orange and yellowish orange. Still has great visual contrast. Great visual contrast, uh, still uh, very vibrant, very vivid, but it's taken that tension, it's taken that conflict, and it's turned it down from 11 a little bit. This one is a fantastic choice for beginners. Use this one because it's difficult to mess up. Now, keep in mind that the primary in this example is the blue, and the split complementary, the ones on either side of what would have been your complementary color palette, those are your secondary and your tertiary colors. Doesn't matter which one's which, that's up to you as long as you stick with it. If the reddish orange you've decided is your secondary, use it as your secondary everywhere you need a secondary color. And that yellowish orange is your tertiary everywhere you need a tertiary color. Don't mix it up. Keep it the same. Maintain that visual cohesion through style, that unity throughout page to page. Split complementary, this is great for you to use. Use that. Triadic. Triadic color schemes are ones that are evenly spaced around the color wheel. So think red, blue, yellow, not RGB. Remember, this is a different color wheel. So this is red, blue, yellow, equally distance, triadic, like triangles, um, three points uh, equally spaced around this. Uh, triadic color uh, harmonies are also vibrant. Um, and these work great at any color combination. You'll see this a lot using um, um, uh, spring festivals or around Easter, where you have those um, uh, those very muted, uh, the pastel color palettes. Trinic works great for those. But to use that triadic harmony successfully, these colors need a very careful balance between the three. Um, let one color dominate and use the two others for accents, but it's still challenging to maintain this balance in a triadic uh, color palette. So don't use this one. Tetradic, rectangle. So it's like that split complementary on steroids. So instead of doing the split side on just the secondary and tertiary colors, we're using the split side on the primary as well. This gives us four colors. A rich color scheme, uh, plenty of possibilities for uh, variation. Uh, this one works best if you let one color be dominant. So whether, I don't know, maybe that's the blue, maybe that's the purple. Um, but maintaining the balance. So your secondary must be one of the colors on the other side. If blue is your primary, purple cannot be your secondary. That reddish orange or the yellowish orange is your secondary. You need to maintain that balance between the warm colors and the cool colors as well. The warm colors are uh, your reds and oranges and yellows and the cool, cool colors are your greens and your blues and your purples. Um, still challenging to maintain that balance. Don't use it. Now, of course, I know, Jay, you just went over six different types of color palettes. And you told us we couldn't use any but the one, but split complementary. So it's like, don't use this, and don't use this, and don't use this, and don't you do this, and what am I allowed to use, Dad? Thanks, Dad. Why just give me just one? Why not just focus on the one and not waste my time? Well, 
We're all software developers. We're not going to build our own color palette. We're going to build some, you're going to use some sort of tool that builds our color palette for us. One of my favorites is color.adobe.com. Color.adobe.com is a great online tool for building color palettes. But these tools, they're going to have a drop down that has a lot of different palette types. And you're going to see analogous, and you're going to see monochrome, and you're going to be complementary, you're going to see triadic, and you're going to see tetradic, and you're going to see so many different color combinations in your palette in this drop down, and you're going to be like, neat, shiny things. Let's try one of those. No. Split complementary. We're the rookies. We're the noobs. We're the beginners. Stick with split complementary. I went over the others so you knew what they were and you knew how they were used, but you know your role. You know which ones to stick with and you don't get lost into the shiny. Man. Often I also get asked about the psychology of color because someone's gonna say, hey, I read about, I don't know, a book on feng shui and I learned all about the psychology of color and they said that blue is great for relaxing and sleeping and orange is great for a whole lot of energy and it's very vibrant and red makes you angry. So tell us more about the psychology of colors and how it drives emotion. No, you don't care. It's not for you. Yes, yellow is happiness because it's smiley, but so is white. And black is the color of sophistication, but so is purple because that's royalty. And so is pink. It's all cultural. If blue makes us sleepy and relaxed and want to go take a nap, then why is blue one of the most popular colors for a car? Because, you know, on the road while, uh, while I'm driving is exactly where I want to be sleepy and relaxed and about to take a nap. People choose blue cars because it's their favorite color. People choose orange cars because orange is their favorite color. People choose red cars because it's their favorite color. They pick black cars because it's their favorite color. They pick brown cars because it's the only car left on the lot. I don't know. Pick your favorite color. Whatever the psychology of the color doesn't matter, pick your favorite color and go with that for uh, your color palettes. Really what you need to focus on is the accessibility of color because of everybody in this meeting, statistically, several of us suffer from some sort of vision impairment, particularly around color blindness. See, uh, our color reception inside of our eyeballs all comes from this type of cell called a cone. And there are, unsurprisingly, three different types of cones inside of a human eyeball. One type of cone is primarily responsible for the longer wavelengths, like red. And one of the cones in our eyes is primarily responsible for the medium wavelengths, like green and one of the types of cones is primarily responsible for uh, the shorter wavelengths like purple and blue. Matches the RGB of our monitors. That's why we see three colors and all of the other colors that we see are really just a blend of those three colors because we have three different types of cones uh, in our eyes. Uh, and color blindness comes from a deficiency uh, with one of those types of cones. Let's take, for example, the protonomes. Protons have deficiencies on recognizing long wavelengths in uh, our color spectrum. So the red side. Protons are generally the ones that we refer to as red, green, colorblind. But let's take two colors that aren't red and green. Let's take pink and blue. Of course, the hex codes are right there. And if this is a gross approximation, but it illustrates the point. The hex codes are right there. The difference between these two colors is the red, is the red element of this RGB hex code. Pink and blue are not red and green, but if we remove the red from the spectrum, then they both just became become shades of lavender. The pink and blue that had a very high contrast for someone with normative vision, 
loses all of its contrast for a protan. If you're a dutan and you have a deficiency in recognizing changes in the medium wavelengths, that yellow and green color spectrum, let's take yellow and red. Two colors differing in only the green aspect of that RGB focus. These are not green colors. They're mustard and ketchup. But if we remove green from the spectrum, now we get, I don't know, tan and baby poo brown. And they're not red and green anymore. They're just close shades of yellow. Uh, and tritonopes have deficiencies in the short wavelengths. The, it's a blue-yellow co color blindness. Um, so let's take two blue-yellow colors. Let's take the blue out of the spectrum with pink and orange. They just become rows with no contrast whatsoever. Accessibility is what you need to wor worry about with color, not the psychology. And there are some great uh, tools I see in the comments that there are some uh, already some comments going out about Section 508 compliance. Uh, WK. Um, the web content accessibility guidelines. There's some great tools, uh, even inside of Chrome and in Firefox. If you go into your dev tools and you highlight an element, that little circle or square that shows the color swatch, uh, it'll tell you if there's enough visual contrast between these two colors. It'll give you all of that accessibility information you need. Um, Firefox is great. Chrome, I'm not so much of a fan of Chrome. I tend to develop in Firefox, but when it comes to its accessibility stuff, Chrome is head and shoulders above with this aspect because that, that little swatch that shows the foreground color of the currently selected element inside of the dev tools, Firefox will show if there's a high enough uh, a contrast rating for the colors. Um, and if there's not, just give you a, a, an X of no, you shall not pass. Chrome takes it a step farther and makes recommendations. But if you chose this color instead, that would give you the visual contrast you need against the background color. So a lot of this, there's a lot of phenomenal tools out for, for doing this stuff. So in addition to color, I also said I'd go over typeface, um, the font choices, the text choices um, inside of, of your applications and web, websites. We start out with the classification of the font uh, itself. It's four different types of uh, classifications. First and foremost uh, is serif. This font is book antiqua and it's serif. It's not serif, it's serif. So it has its own lesser known gif versus gif battle. It's serif. When is the serif? Well, yes, most people just say it's the, the little feet on the letter form, the little foot sticking out of the R. Yes, that's a serif, but it's not just the feet. The serif is all over the letter, letter form. It's the, the protrusions that hang up or down from the S. It's the protrusions that hang out from the top of the R instead of just to the bottom of the R. But it's more still than that. There's also a stress on serif-based fonts, a thick, thin, as the, the line of the letter form itself transitions from thick to thin based on uh, an, an axis, that stress. All of this provides a tremendous amount of contrast within the letter form and makes it very, very, very easy to read. It's great for large amounts of text. If you are using large amounts of text, use a serif based font. There was a time back in the day in the GeoCities days, when they advised never use a serif-based font on the web, always use a sans serif-based font on the web, but that was back in our GeoCities days when our monitors had, our big monitors, had a whopping 640 pixels to them. We have a little bit more than 640 pixels in our monitor displays. I think, oh, about that much of my monitor right now is 640 pixels. We have a lot of granularity. We have a lot of definition in our displays now, both in uh, digital form on our monitors and physical form on our printouts. Books have been using a serif-based fonts for centuries, and our monitors have higher definitions than the printouts on our books. Use this for a large amount of text. This font is called Humanist. It's a sans-serif font. Not only does it not have the feet 
the protrusions on the letter form, but it also is mono weight. Not mono space, mono weight. Mono weight means that the line of the letter form is consistent. The thickness of the letter form is consistent throughout the line. There's no stress. There's no axis to this letter form. Sans serif works well for headlines. Works best for headlines. So here's a good place to use it on your headlines. If you're making a web page, use it on your H1s, H2s, H3s, H4s, through H6s. And leave the serif-based font for your divs and your paragraph tags. So this works well uh, as also a contrast to the uh, serif aspect of your body copy, your body text. Never use more than one font within each of these categories. The third type is script fonts. This font is called Edwardian. Um, takes more effort to read these script-based fonts uh, for two reasons. Partially because of cosmetics, the fanciness, if you want to call it that, of the font makes it more challenging to read, but also uh, it's unfamiliar. As calligraphy would fall underneath a, a script font, Benjamin Franklin's handwriting, my grandmother's cursive would all fall underneath a script font. Um, and uh, they're falling out of favor. They're not as familiar as they once were. Uh, I'm sure Ben Franklin could read this script font faster than he could read the print of uh, a serif based font, all because of that familiar. Uh, sure, these script fonts are attractive and they are elegant, uh, but don't use them. Never use them in all caps, but really don't use them unless you have um, a small amount of text used sparingly. Sort of like the center alignment from earlier, you'll see the script fonts a lot on wedding invitations. But generally, you don't have to read a wedding, a wedding invitation. You already know what it says. There's not much text there. Such and such a person is marrying such and such a person at such and such a time, at such and such a day, at this place. Are you going to be there? Yes or no? And it's probably not a surprise that you got the wedding invitation. You already knew they were getting married. You already knew what the date was. It's just, hey, you come in, yes or no. So there's not much to read. Works for a script-based font then. Uh, use this very sparingly only on small amounts of text. Generally, you're going to use this like on your, your logo mark. And fourth, well, this font is Curls MT uh, Decorative. <laughs> use these ones very sparingly. Use these ones in very small quantities. Use these on very special occasions. Like, I don't know, hey, everybody, there's donuts by the printer. Then you can use Comic Sans. It's a decorative font. Beyond that, yeah. Not so much. It's hard to take these fonts seriously, just like the Comic Sans that you got in an email that had all blue text that let you know that they were donuts by the printer. Now, as you're working on all these top typefaces, make sure that you are focusing on contrast, not conflict. Creating conflict in your fonts is when your fonts are too close, and that can be in typeface, how many people can really tell the difference between Helvetica and Arial? Most people don't know the difference between the two. Your brains know. Your brain says, ooh, that R is just, something's not right. It's a little bit different than this other R. I can't quite tell. But these two letters, they're the same letter, but they're not the same. And then we have a distraction. Then we have that context switch. Then we're dropping our uh, the, uh, the, the pleasure that we derive, how pleasing that view is. And, deleting the app because it's ugly, because the R's weren't the same R, because there was conflict in its letter forms uh, or in its font sizes. Sure, there's a big difference between, I don't know, uh, a 12-point font and an 18-point font. We can tell the difference between a 12-point font and an 18-point font. And there's a lot of difference between the two. There's a lot of contrast. But that six-point six, six difference, what if it was a 100-point font versus a 106-point font? I'm not going to be able to tell the difference anymore. So now we just got into conflict. Now, I say that we can't tell the difference because we can't really identify it. We just know something's off. It's that distraction. Hey, that R is a little tiny bit bigger than this other R. It should be the same, but I think it's the same. But my brain's telling me it's not the same. And now we've got conflict. Now we've got that distraction. Now we've got the con context switch. Now we're deleting the app. So focus on contrast with your letter form. Um, not conflict. Well, also to describe uh, fonts, there's texture. 
Texture is challenging to describe of a font. English sucks for describing texture because we don't have a lot of words for describing texture. We have smooth and rough, and that's about it. We have some synonyms for rough. Maybe we call it bumpy, but smooth and rough is about all we've got. Coarse, fine, no, not really. There's not a lot of words in English to describe texture. We say that we got a little different texture, our food can have a different texture, but we have tough time putting words to texture. So fonts can have a texture too. If you're focusing on the texture of your fonts, again, make sure that there's contrast and not conflict. And fonts also have a color. Now I'm not talking about red versus blue. Think of color more along the lines of how much ink is being used on the sheet of paper for drawing this letter form when it's still the exact same size as another letter form. Weight, boldness contributes to color, but I'm talking more of when it's different fonts in their regular weight, their normal weight. How much ink do they put on the screen? What's the color of those fonts? Now, when you're using all of these different typefaces and using all of this different typography, when you begin, start at the base font. Start at the standard text, your body copy, your paragraph tag, and start from there. Often I've seen websites that built where, hey, we're gonna start at the ba banner, we're gonna start at that big header at the top and that's gonna be our H1. So that's the one we're gonna style first and we're gonna work our way down. And oftentimes as we're working on our way down, we've want, run out of room to really build any um, contrast for our H4s versus our H5s, differentiating our H5s versus just a paragraph tag. And then we create conflict, not contrast. So start at the base font, start at your paragraph tag and work your way up, not starting at your H1s and working your way down. And use restraint. Too many typefaces can make your design into a ransom note, like we just cut out letters from whatever magazine we could find. It's you know another one of those crazy conspiracy emails that you got forwarded from your crazy uncle. It's that Comic Sans notification at work that there's still some donuts left over by the printer. Uh, use some restraint, never more than one font from any of those four categories. Really, realistically, it's going to be one serif font and one sans serif font and using your font sizes appropriately to make, make sure that you're creating contrast and not conflict. So when you're putting this all together, when we you know, wrap this all into a bow through our composition, first and foremost, you're gonna start with the focal point. You're gonna tell your story. Remember that you control where the eye goes. You control where the eye goes through that conflict. If we go all the way through the pie chart and the bar graph and we change from the contrast on size to the contrast on color, we can define the focal point. You define the focal point wherever it is. It's yours to control. Group your information together. Like we talked about using proximity, uh, those label tags being closely associated with the form element that the labels go to. Um, maintain those strong elements and remember that the edges of the canvas, the end, uh, edges of the page, the window, the monitor are just as much of an alignment element as the text or images on your screen. This layout is absolutely hideous. It's gross. But we can clean it up with some alignments. Make that header align with the navigation, which aligns with heading, which aligns with the body copy. The body copy aligns with the bar graph. They all align with the edge of the canvas, the edge of the window, the edge of the monitor. But also, they align with the opposite side. The margin, if you want to call it that, on the left is the same as the margin that's on the right. Ever print out a sheet of paper, uh, print out uh, a pages or a Word document that uh, was off center on its margins, that it had a one inch margin on the left, but only a half inch margin on the right, and it just felt odd? It's an alignment point too. Maintain that repetition. The colors. Uh, that you choose, the typefaces you choose. In those colors, making sure that whatever you choose for your secondary stays your secondary. Whatever you choose as your tertiary, 
stays as your tertiary. Whatever you choose as your primary is absolutely your primary throughout the application. That primary split complementary of the blue and on the other side, we have the reddish orange and the yellowish orange. Our primary is blue. Throughout our application, our primary is blue. That We don't have one page in our application that this one's special. This one, I want to do something a little bit different. So this one, I'm going to do reddish orange as the primary color. And the yellowish orange and the blue can be my secondary and tertiary. No. There's no case where you ever want to put a horizontal bar on both sides of the door. Ever. No. Not ever. Not once. We didn't go to design school. That's not our choice. And even if we did, we would know that it's not a good choice to do. And stick with your contrast. Contrast is how we quickly identify those visual elements of the screen. It doesn't work without anything else. They all of these elements work together, but these, this one, this thing, this contrast is so important. This is the most important element because if we don't manage it carefully, we get conflict, and that's not what we want. We want contrast. This is not contrast. This is contrast. And follow the rules. Before you can break a rule, you have to know what the rule is, but we don't. We don't really know the rules. We've now spent an hour talking about six of the fundamentals we really don't know the rules yet so we it's our responsibility as the beginners as the rookies as the noobs to just follow the rules as best we can so for some further reading from here number one first recommendation if there was no other recommendation this is it nancy duarte's slideology great book it's like 25 bucks on amazon Great book, go get it. It's about building slides, great slide decks. Now, yeah, what does that have to do with building an application or a web page? Everything. Design is design is design is design is design. It doesn't matter if you're building a web application, a mobile application, a slide, an invitation for your Halloween party. It doesn't matter. Composition is rules are the same throughout all design. So pick up this awesome book. Uh, Nancy Duarte's Slideology. It's like 25 bucks on Amazon. You've already had enough time to go to Amazon and click the Buy Now button. And if you want to buy two books, The Non-Designer's Design Book by Robin Williams. Not that Robin Williams. Dr. Robin Williams, she made this awesome book. Uh, there's a couple of them, but this is the first, The Non-Designer's Design Book. It's a great book for, well, non-designers that want to learn some of the fundamentals of design. Uh, this one's a little bit more expensive. It's like 28 or 30 bucks on Amazon, usually. Um, so those are the two books, Nancy Duarte's Slideology and Robin Williams' uh, Non-Designer's Design Book. So for our next steps, really remember. Remember that being a non-designer doesn't mean that you are horrible at design. It's not an excuse to just make everything battleship gray and completely ugly. Maybe it is. On certain scenarios, um, I had a colleague many moons ago, uh, probably it's approaching 20 years now, certainly 15 years ago now. Uh, his name is uh, is Dennis Burton. We used to work at a shop where uh, the project manager wouldn't always spend the time to make sure that the designers and the UX developers got some time to clean up the usability uh, and the intuitiveness uh, of the applications. Whatever the non-designer developers made, as ugly as it was, that's what often got shipped. So we took things into our own hands. And when we built out any text on the screen, everything went into an H3. Absolutely all text on the screen was in a header three tag, all of it. Doesn't matter if it was the H1 or the paragraph tags or the text that's inside of a list item, it went into an H3 and it was just absolutely hideous. It was absolutely hideous. So the designers and the UX teams had to touch it, to make it not all H3s. But yeah, just because you're a non-designer doesn't mean that you are a horrible designer. You might not have a designer at your team and that's okay. Just follow some of these basic rules and at least it can level you up a few times. So practice those concepts. I did, I'm not a designer. I have no, no, no artistic 
talent in my body at all. I see uh, I see Lucky Girly Girl making a few comments uh, in, in the chat. She's a great designer. You should see some of the art that she makes. It's amazing. But me, no. Uh, yet I made this. Uh, many people say that this slide deck looks great. I just followed Nancy Duarte and what she taught me. Uh, it's just text and shapes. So you can do this stuff too. Um, and whatever it is, um, use that to level up your own game, level up your own designs and make your own awesome. Um, I still see the chat going by. I apologize if there were some questions that went by and I missed. I'll scroll through them and see if they have anything, but I am seeing the chats that go by if you have any questions now. Uh, I know there's also uh, a Zoom thing coming up where we can discuss further. Uh, of course, there's always Twitter. Uh, hit me up uh, at Jay Harris uh, on Twitter for any questions that you have. Uh, inevitably, Murphy's Law says the best question that you have is going to be the one after we've already hung up from all of these various virtual calls. So hit me up uh, on Twitter uh, at Jay Harris or shoot me an email, uh, j at aranasoft. Uh, dot com. Uh, always happy to to engage further on, on these topics. But uh, beyond that, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate I appreciate your time and and your willingness to to learn some new things to, to level up. So yeah, you good job. Thank you so much, Jay. That was really fantastic. I love this talk. Can we get some applause in the chat again for Jay? Uh, just Show some appreciation there. Um, and definitely check Jay out on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn. We actually linked to that from the show notes, the, the meetup notes. So um, I think you, anything else you want to call out, Jay, before we kind of move on or questions yeah, you want to entertain? That was it. I, I, I appreciate everybody hanging out. That was great. It's been fantastic. All right. Well, we will catch you just after these uh you know kind of closing notes and uh you know in the zoom if yeah that'd be great yep all right all right thank you so much jay again as promised we're going to give away that jet brains license if you have not signed up yet go ahead and do that by typing csc in the chat don't forget to follow us on Twitch while you're at it. Of course, I want to remind you to follow us on your platforms of choice. Um, whatever that is for you, you can mostly find us there. So from I'm dropping the link tree in our link tree in the chat right now so you can find us while you're doing that. And Um, if you want to speak, we're currently finalizing our talk for next month, um, but we are beginning to plan for the future. And it, I want to take this opportunity, since I screwed up and didn't have the talk prepared, didn't have the talk selected for next month. If you want to speak at CSC at some point in the future, or you know someone we should have on the, uh, on the meetup, let us know. You can email me or find us on social media or any of those things. Definitely. Uh, shouldn't be too hard to find us. So we're going to go ahead and do the drawing for the JetBrains license. We want to tell you that you need to respond if you're drawn or else we're going to draw someone else. So Kat, are you ready? We're going to do that drawing. Mr. Modulo appears to have been drawn for the giveaway. Mr. Modulo, are you still around? Awesome. Make sure that you connect with Kat to get her your email so that we can get that license over to you. With that, I wanna say thank you to all of our attendees. We do love you. We love bringing everyone together for these events. As always, I'd love to hear your feedback. Is Cincinnati Software Craftsmanship your favorite meetup? If not, why not? And what would you like to see from us in the future? Of course, you can email me at michaelcraftsmanship.dev or find us, find me all over the place. With that, 
I hope that you'll join us on Zoom for the post-presentation social time. We'll drop that link in the comments right now. I think that's the right one. <laughs> and without further ado, I bid you all a good evening. I look forward to seeing you in just a minute.